How do you make decisions? Why do you buy certain products? Why do you vote for the people you vote for? Ultimately, what goes on behind our decision making? And the, when I was in university, these were the kind of questions I would obsess over. Um, maybe in an effort to understand myself better, and maybe in an effort to be able to make better decisions. So I remember being at EFT, spending countless hours dissecting brains and trying to find exactly where motivation lives in the brain. Ultimately, I wanted to take that knowledge and apply it to business in an effort to try to convince big companies to better understand people. I heard of a new term at the time called, this was early 2000s, called neuromarketing, which was plainly, you know, simply put, it's about taking a century of neuroscience research and applying it to what marketing does. And I thought, I'm going to be the first person in Canada to study this, possibly in the world. So I was so excited. I go up to my professor at the time, and I explain to him what I'm passionate about. And he listens. Then he goes, hmm, I'm not sure if anyone's going to need this in the future. I mean, why would anyone would want to study this? So I thought, OK, now I really need to do this. Um, I couldn't spend another year dissecting brains, so I went straight to working in marketing. I saw basically how businesses have very, very little understanding of exactly what goes on behind decision making, and they have little understanding of human psychology in general. So, I mean, you don't have to look very far to look to some phenomenal fails from some companies. Like, for example, this ad. <laughs> or this unfortunate ad placement in a subway. Or this campaign. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> and of course, the classics. Um, so it, it's clear, it was clear to me at the time, companies have very little uh, knowledge and they haven't always been great at communicating with people. Um, but what could I do about it? I wanted to dive deeper and I wanted to be more proactive instead of just simply reacting to the market. So I would turn to market research. And when you think of market research, this is basically what comes to mind. Uh, and this is what we would normally do. We would bring a group of people, sit them down around a room, um, and ask them a number of questions. You know, what do you like? What don't you like? The challenge with that is that oftentimes the person who was the loudest in the room would often dominate the conversation. And sometimes the moderator would influence the answer in the way that they asked the question. Or sometimes people, just out of their goodness of their heart, would say what they thought the moderator wanted to hear. So I thought, okay, well, what other tool do I have to try to understand what's, you know, what people want? And we had surveys, so we would send out thousands of surveys to paid respondents who, by the way, get paid even though, you know, you know regardless of what they answer. Um, and ultimately trying to get closer to being proactive. But I found out that this actually didn't bring me much closer um, to understanding what people do. So this goes on all the time today. Um, with companies and this is why I'm here to talk to you about why I feel like we need to change this. See the main flaw with this model of research is that people don't act on what they say. <laughs> it's no surprise, people act on how they feel. We act according to our core, core values and core principles. We act according to what feels right. So we don't sit at home thinking, hmm, that company's direct mail campaign was on brand, but their digital channel had a low click-through rate. You know, we just buy based on trust, right? It's an emotion, it's a feeling. So sometimes you find companies trying to talk to you and they end up sounding kind of like this. Okay, right? Anyone got that? <laughs> okay, I'm not the only one. Okay, so I'll give you some examples in action in a little bit. Uh, but what I find is that luckily things these days are actually changing a lot. Companies, at least the good ones, are starting to think differently about their customers and they're focusing on promoting positive human values. They're bringing emotion measurement basically into the mix. 
And so there, this is a new era in marketing, one that is centered around human needs. And I believe that the future marketplace will actually reward companies that understand emotion, that place people's well-being first, and ultimately give us products and services that are meaningful. So let's start by looking at a little bit about and learning about how do we go about measuring emotion in the first place. What you see here is an EEG headset being set up. An EEG or electroencephalogram is a tool that measures brain activity and it lets us know what you like and what you dislike among many other things. And we combine that with something called eye tracking. So it's important that when you're out navigating the world, we see exactly what captures your attention. So eye tracking lets us know where you look and when we combine that with the EEG, we know where you look and how you feel at the same time. This is obviously invaluable insight to companies who are trying to connect at that emotional level because you would otherwise never get this information. You know, we measure 256 times a second, so temporal resolution is fantastic. Um, but I'd like to share with you some examples from my work so you can see just how appealing to our humanity is actually good for business. So I get this question a lot, you know, does this actually work? Um, well, Burger King seems to think so. This is an example of a coupon flyer that was mailed out a couple of months ago. The goal was to promote the Angry Whopper, and so we use the type of eye tracking to let us know where people are looking. And so the areas that are more um, red or yellow are areas of visual attention, basically. We saw that a lot of people are basically not even looking at the Whopper as much as they are looking at the sandwich behind it. So we provided some recommendations, and the new version looked a lot simpler. <laughs> And so you had a lot more visual attention now going directly to the key call to action is what we call it. And you know, this small change actually resulted in 40% increase in gross profits from coupons. So you wouldn't think it, but small little iteration and small little changes that come from neuroscience can actually make a huge, huge impact in the marketplace. Another one, um, so Colgate came to us trying to understand how do you build trust at the shelf and how do you understand what, you know, what motivates people when they shop in this category. Um, we had people test two different types of packages. We went through a number of iterations, we put a new package up and we tested it against the current package. We saw, now surprisingly, that what people actually ended up purchasing was directly correlated with what they felt like, with what they reacted to initially. So they reacted very positively to this new pack design they ended up selecting it without ever asking them a single question. And what does this actually result in? 20% more purchases with the new pack design. Very, very small changes, but very subtle. They're the kind of changes that take about 300 milliseconds for your brain to register. Now, we were working with Miller Coors and I wanted to see how can I help them be relevant in the marketplace? And particularly when it comes to mobile apps and when you get advertisements while you're playing a game or something like that, you have a choice of getting an ad that's gonna pop up and take up your whole screen, or you can view an ad that's gonna give you a, uh, something in return. So they had this question, how do we go about marketing to people within a mobile environment? Should we go about pop up? And what you see here from my tracking, you see a bright red corner um, over uh, at the top on the, on the pop up basically add, that is basically the X button. So that's how much motivation people had to look over there and just try to get rid of it as fast as possible. And the, you know, the contrast to that was an ad that uh, came to you at a moment in your gameplay when you were out of lives, let's say, or out of points, and it gave you a return in exchange for you watching a short ad. You see a countdown and then it said, okay, thank you, now here's your bonus. So it was a lot more relevant, and this actually results in a lot more relevancy. More time and more cognitive engagement with the brand, three times more time with the brand, and ultimately more motivation response. This is in neuroscience we call the most predictive metric of behavior. When your brain has a higher motivational response for something, we can actually anticipate that behavior will follow with a lot greater accuracy than from a survey. So very interesting stuff. Again, relevancy, trust, we're talking about building that emotional connection. And another example I wanted to share with you comes from Canada Post, who back in 2005, we had the pleasure of um, you know, diving deeper and understanding what's the difference between the 
um, tactile medium, the direct mail medium, and the digital medium. You know, what happens in people's minds when they receive a postcard versus when they receive an email on their laptop or on their smartphone? So we had a chance to look at, first of all, the way the communication is delivered. You're able to actually feel something in your hand, so your tactile senses are engaged. This is something that digital will not trump over, basically. So we <coughs> were standing on a mountain of evidence to show that the tactile medium matters. But we dove deeper and we looked at different types of, um, you know, what kind of mail? Does the mail? Should the mail have a type of scent to it? Should it play a sound when you open it? Right? All kinds of things like that that were basically interesting in understanding what, how people react to the physical versus the digi digital medium. And ultimately, when you engage with people's brains and you engage their tactile sense, you actually get a higher motivational response. Which, like I mentioned before, in neuroscience is correlated with the perceived product value and the perceived product quality. You also get 21% um, easier to understand. So when you're obviously holding something, you don't get pop-ups, you don't have multiple windows taking up your ads or notifications, so you're able to focus only on one thing. Your, uh, your brain is able to focus and a lot more likely that is going to remember what you're seeing. So okay, enough with the stats. The point is that we as consumers actually deserve a human-friendly marketplace. So businesses originally or traditionally think in terms of demographics. They think of consumers as numbers and data and de demographics basically as um, ROI, return on investment. So what I'm here to say is that companies, it's about time that companies become emotionally intelligent and see people as people, not just as numbers. I mean, even for myself as a consumer, it would be amazing to see a marketplace decluttered and, you know, a place where we can remove some of the awful me uh, media messages uh, that we get to see. And it would be great to see a marketplace where positive human values are actually promoted, but not at the expense of capital gain. So I believe that we can have both profits and a conscience, and I think it all starts with better human understanding. Thank you.